History happened everywhere. A random country, a random time, and a topic pulled from the hat. Then a week for one of us to go away and find out all that we can, then come back and reveal all to the other. You're listening to... History happened everywhere. Hello, welcome to History Happened Everywhere. I'm Pete Goddard, and this over here is Ryan Weir. <laughs> Hello. You, can, you can't see him, but he's looking very handsome today. Oh. You're looking fresh-faced, like you've had an exciting week. Have you had an exciting week, Ryan? I have had a thrilling week. Uh, looking up a country which I knew nothing about and uh, learning an awful lot about it. Roller coaster ride of knowledge. Proper roller coaster ride, yeah. All right, well, I'm looking forward to hearing that. Yeah. Hey, um, I've got a question for you. Go on. So, do you have any sort of superstitions? For the podcast, podcast I do. I consider it good luck to bash my head on the light that's above the studio. <laughs> <laughs> Which is something that does we happen every do week. That. I mean, it's not actually a deliberate superstition, but it feels like if it didn't happen, somehow things would go wrong. <laughs> If you hear this, that's the sound of a good podcast about to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Quickly followed by us going, oh, for yeah, for that's that's gonna, oh, that. So that's not quite a superstition, but something that uh, I weirdly would be worried if we didn't do it at this point. Yeah. So I don't have a superstition, but I do vocal warm ups. <clears throat> But I do do vocal warm <laughs> <laughs> I generally don't know if that was a joke. <laughs> I do do <laughs> vocal warm ups. <laughs> it's a little trick I learned. <laughs> a little, it's very little effective. <laughs> effective. So, Brian. Yes, Peter. I am. I'm an eager receptacle for your knowledge. <laughs> okay. So tell me things. Uh, I yeah. Don't know. Well, let's start by reminding ourselves of the country, time, and topic for this week's podcast. All right, let's check it out. Let's hit that rewind button. <laughs> it's time to run the doors later. All right, can I press the button? Uh, yeah. I never get to press the button. Right, of course you can. I'm coming over. All right. And, uh, okay, we're running. The, it, the, the pistons are pumping. Right. The oil is greasing. <laughs> <laughs> right, and your country is... Algeria. Okay, Algeria. Algeria. <laughs> it's a country. <laughs> like, I mean, it's a place, right? right. It's, not, it's not unknown. It's uh, sure. Algeria. a huge amount about it. Uh, your time period is 1940 to 1950. I love that period of time. It keeps coming up for you, doesn't it? I haven't done 40 to 50, so I'm okay with that. And your topic is nature. Oh, cool. We did that one for uh, Sweden, didn't we? Is that nature? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. okay. It was. So we're going to learn all about nature in Algeria in 1940 to 1950. So, how do you feel about Algeria? I know, I, I know almost nothing, so I'm pretty excited because uh, I, I, I said I was a receptacle. It turns mm. out I'm an entirely empty receptacle in matters Algerian. Yeah, I'm discovering through doing, well, this is the 21st of our podcast, that I know nothing about the world, as it seems. <laughs> it is remarkably embarrassing, isn't it? Hugely cloistered week, life. Like, oh, so that's another entire <laughs> mass of people and land that I was totally oblivious to. <laughs> <laughs> and such... Um, uh, so I begin with that as my <laughs> as, uh, starting point. Okay, Algeria. Let's start there, shall we? Where is it? Where is Algeria? Think of Africa, the continent of Africa. Think of the north of Africa. I know, so, I know of Africa. That far I can get. <laughs> it's uh, part of the Maghreb region, so-called now. It used to be called the Barbary Coast. Oh, really? Where yes. the Barbary apes came from? Yes. So also named after the Berber people. Oh, really? That, that live there. Yeah, Barbary Coast, Berbery Coast. Uh, yeah, but, but the Berbers don't call it uh, the Barbary Coast. They call or it Or indeed home. the Maghreb region. <laughs> they do call it that. Uh, they call it Tamazia. 
Or Tamazka. Okay. And it's part of like that North Africa is a bunch of countries that, that take up the northern part of Africa. We start at the top. You've got the Mediterranean Sea. Yep. That's like the main coastline for Algeria. Uh, to the left, west, uh, Morocco, Mali, and Mauritania. Oh, Mali's there as well. Okay. Yeah, Morocco, Mali, and Mauritania. So Morocco I know of and could all place. All the M's. So I'll, I'll, I'll work my way out from Morocco. <laughs> yeah, all the, all the M's to the left. And to the right, you've got Tunisia and uh, yep. Libya. Right, okay. Yep, that's... I knew, I'm totally aware of Tunisia and Libya, and yet yeah. somehow I had no idea Algeria was right there as well. It is, yeah, they're all around there. And then uh, below Algeria is Niger, or Niger. I've always said Niger, but uh, it's Niger. probably worth doing some research on. I did, and the internet told me it was Niger. Okay, cool. Anyway, it, uh, Algeria, it is the 10th largest country in the world. 10th? Wow. The 10th largest. I had no no idea. That, that, for that to sneak under the radar is right? slightly embarrassing, isn't it's it? It's ridiculous. <laughs> like, how do we not know that? Uh, yeah, so uh, 900,000 square miles, 2.4 million square kilometres. Wow. Uh, any I don't ideas? know what that is in France. Is. Any idea how many Algerias in a France? I think you'd probably get five Frances in there, wouldn't you? Close. 9.7 Frances to an Algeria. The ten, Almost 10 Frances wow, to an Algeria. And France it's is a huge. non-trivial nation. That's amazing. Yeah, that's exactly right. It's the uh, largest by area in Africa and the Arab world. So it is huge. It's bigger than Nigeria. Bigger than Nigeria. Wow. Yeah. Uh, it was uh, the second largest in Africa, uh, the Sudan, held that title for a while and then recently split into North and South Right, let's talk about uh, the people that live there. Uh, 44 million, so there are there arounds at the moment. Uh, most living in the northern part, right by the sea. Um, so, so it's a pretty empty country, right? Ten one, times the size of France, but less than the population of Britain. Yeah, like all of those people live in, in one-fifth of the entire landmass wow. of Algeria, right by the sea. So you've got Algiers, the capital city. It's a seaside city, as you would expect, given that it's in the north, right by the Med. And then you've got Oran, or Oran, which is their second big city, and that's a port near Morocco. Most of the people there uh, speak um, Arabic. That's either Algerian or Berber. And I don't expect you to know the answer to this, but people say people speak Arabic, but what, uh, Arabic covers a lot of ground in terms of countries yeah. sp that speak it. I wonder how different the Arabics of different nations are, because it's, it's always sort of presented as a homogenous whole, isn't it? But yeah. in the same way as British and American English are quite different in some ways. Well, enough that most of their road signs have uh, both the Algerian and the Berber Arabic as separate words on it. Oh, really? Yeah. So they'll have French, Algerian Arabic, and then Berber Arabic as well on a road sign. Interesting. So it must be significantly different, I guess. French, as I just mentioned, uh, it's used for administrative purposes, really. So if you're buying a house or you're going to court or something, you're going to be using French. But just I get a waft of colonialism coming across. Yeah, here. <laughs> that, that may that may come up. Um, yeah, it's an interesting one. Um, basically, just don't call them French. They, yeah, they, they had don't some like it very challenges, much. didn't they? I'm, I'm, my history does tell me a little bit of unpleasantness was a there was a lot of unpleasantness yeah and the relationship was uh, very poor it seems to have improved it seems to have sort of calmed down between the algerians and the french such that it's been described as like the relationship between the usa and england oh really yeah so sort of very that's better than i would have expected point, but from now the history yeah yeah well that's what i would have thought um but yeah 1962 uh, they get independence from France, um, and they're now officially called the People's Democratic Republic of Algeria. Uh, the flag. We, you talked about the Mozambique flag last time, and I, I liked that we went into that. This one is slightly less, st less styled uh, than the Mozambique flag. There's a lot less in it. Fewer um, ingredients. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, split 50-50, uh, half green, um, and then half white. And it's got a red star and a crescent in the middle. Now, you might think the Red Star, you know, communists and stuff, but that's not. It represents Islam and the blood spilt in their fight for independence. Wow. Okay, so let's talk about the history of Algeria. It didn't just appear. Stuff happened to get it to where it is today. And the early man at some point. There was early man. <laughs> early man again shows up. Everywhere. <laughs> You'd think there'd be fewer of them, but they really were all over the place, it seems. Uh, 10,000 BC, uh, we, we're in the African humid period, it's called. 
um, which means that everything in Africa is sort of green and lush and beautiful and there's lots of animals cavorting across savannas and it's a beautiful place. Lots of people milling around. It's good times. Humid though. Not a big fan of humidity. No, but you know, you're used to it. Uh, the Berbers are there. They are, um, they're inhabitants of the whole of North Africa, but Algeria as well. And uh, in Algeria, they're drawing some these super elaborate cave paintings. Uh, over 15,000 have been found so far, which is an awful lot. I guess they had time on their hands, right? Um, but they're documenting all of the animals that they were seeing. So the antelopes and the lions and the, everything that's there, the hyenas. Cavepedia. Cavepedia, yeah, pretty much. And all the people as well. Really beautiful pictures. So yeah, they're documenting all of these animals that, that, that are around them and what they're seeing. And that, that goes on for some time. Around 3000 BC, 3500 BC, the Earth tilts and the orbit changes. Probably top heavy. Yeah, it could well be. Too, Too much early, early man. Stood in one place. <laughs> jumped at the same time. <laughs> that old myth, right? And if everyone on the planet jumped at the same time. I'm almost certain that's what happened. Right. and But because of that tilt and the change in the orbit, the Sahara gets hotter, it starts pointing more towards the sun and becomes the desert that we're familiar with. Um, and so all those animals are lush green, all that disappears, um, all the animals go. House prices and plummet, I would imagine. House prices shoot down. Um, <laughs> yeah, and all those Berbers that were drawing and documenting, they carry on documenting. And they start drawing new animals like camels and deserty type of creatures. So do you think they were out hunting and they'd be like, I've just got to go look something up. <laughs> and they'd run back, run back to the and cave. check the cave and go, oh, yeah, no, that is poisonous. Do not touch that. <laughs> <Don't> touch that <laughs> one. It makes sense that they would probably draw up the things not to touch and stuff for kids and things. You'd think, wouldn't you? Yeah. Yeah, it makes sense. Uh, but what happens is the contact around this time sort of between the coastal communities and where the desert is, so those beneath the desert, that gets broken. And so you've got this split in communities for several thousand years. You would, wouldn't you? It's like, do you want to go visit your cousin? No, no, yeah, all right. A thousand miles <laughs> through a hot desert. A thousand miles of desert yeah. really feels like a big hassle. I mean, That's I right. won't go to visit my cousin and they live in Bromley. <laughs> so I've got sympathy. It's not far. <laughs> okay, so uh, just after that, then you get a number of various groups that all try and step into North Africa and to where Algeria ultimately will become uh, and try and take over. You've got the Phoenicians, the Numidians, the Romans, Carthaginians, the Vandals and Byzantines, the Umayyads, the Abbasids, the Rustamids, the Algobids, the Idrisids, the Fatimids, the Hamadids, the Almovids, the Zionids, the Almohads, the Zirids, the Spanish and the Ottomans. Which brings us to the Ottomans. So in 1500, uh, Algeria uh, becomes like a, a an autonomous province of the Ottoman Empire. So you've got the Ottoman Empire over in Turkey and wherever else are spread around. Um, but over here in North Africa, they go, you know what? You can kind of do what you like as long as you're still part of us. And they go, cool beans. So uh, around 1827, so 300 years later. Right. France, which they're doing trade with, just hasn't been paying their debts. Just keep Is that an option? The uh, no one told me that was an option. I've been paying mine. This is crazy. Yeah, well, you, apparently you don't have to if you're French. Oh, I'm not French. In 1827. Or am I? Oh, yeah. anyway, <laughs> so close. So the, the ruler of the Ottoman Empire at this point, uh, a guy called Hassin, uh, he gets the French consul. He calls him over and he confronts him and says, hey, you know, you owe me money. And the French consul is like, oh, I don't know what you're talking about. I pay you my money. <laughs> it's fine. It's in the post. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so uh, Hussein grabs his fly swat and hits it, the man, angrily with it. Sounds okay. Yeah, which is kind of fine. Uh, the French consul goes away. And not long after, the French minister of war suggests that, you know what? War would be good fun. Whoa, because he swatted him. Yeah. Or because of that swat. Could well be. Uh, yeah, th their argument was that there was lots of veterans of the Napoleonic Wars just sitting around doing nothing and that we ought to give them a job to do. And, that you know, can you start a war out of kicking off in Algeria? <laughs> Is that a thing you can do? Apparently I'm so. learning so much today. You don't have to pay your bills as long as you've got enough soldiers standing around. You can start around, a suppose. war if you've got the, the people. Yeah. And so that's what France do. Uh, they launch a war of conquest. Um, and it they win pretty much almost immediately. There's see, almost no resistance. See, I, f I feel like if I were a veteran of the army and therefore war, more war would be sort of the last thing I wanted to do. So I'd be like, thanks, France, but I'm all right. That's right. Uh, and a year later, France officially makes Algeria its colony. So this is 1848. Um, they start to modernize, as colonizers will do. Agriculture and commercial units start to improve. The economy improves. 
Um, but all the improvements are done to the aid of the French and not the native people. So they're enjoying lovely economic privileges and the Algerians are sitting there going, hey, wait, what? I, I feel we like something? we could pre-record this bit for a lot of the countries that we've been to. And, just go, and Africa. then that colonial thing happens. Throw that in. Yeah. Save you some editing. That's true. <laughs> uh, and, you know, by 20 years later, by 1870, one third of the native population is dead from either disease or starvation. One third. Fun That's times. ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, it's, it even seems counterproductive from the French point of view. You think... You need people to work. You need a functioning you, country. You've got to see that it's heading in one direction, right? Anyway, uh, 30 years later, we're into the 1900s now, and World War One starts. Oh, yes. Hooray. So 200,000 Algerians sign up, in quotes, and go and fight for France. <laughs> um, How voluntary was this, uh, this activity? <laughs> <laughs> Which means that more than one third of all male Algerians between the ages of, sort of 20 and 40 are now in France. Right. Ship them all off to France. 1938, World War II, and the Algerians again are signed up to go and fight in France. Hooray, having just done it. It's a sequel, it's a formula, they know what they're doing. That's right. And now we're into our period. So 1942, we see uh, the war is ongoing. Um, you've got the collapse of France um, as part of that Second World War. Um, and you've got the Axis, the Anglo-Americans now in North Africa. They're occupying there. Um, and the Allies are promising an end to, uh, you know, any of the sort of colonization formerly subject peoples. They've done the same in Syria and uh, other areas, and they're now promising this in North Africa. So the Algerians get together and they draw up a manifesto where they seek like this uh, basically political or autonomy. Um, you know, they, they want to be their own, their own thing. And uh, a year later, Charles de Gaulle, um, says France owes Muslims of North Africa for their loyalty. And so he gives uh, French citizenship to certain categories of Algerian Muslims, which sounds great. I was going to say, I feel that that certain categories is doing a lot of work there. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's doing a lot of work and it's not enough for the Algerians. And two years later, they're peacefully demonstrating when the French decide to just shoot into the crowd. Uh, as you would, might expect, an uprising ensues um, and 84 European settlers are killed and f up to, it's unclear exactly how many, uh, but up to 45,000 Muslims are massacred. That is not a score draw by any stretch of the imagination. It's really not. 84 versus 45,000. Yeah. Anyway, uh, two years later, the Algerians propose again uh, a new manifesto, sort of these, these two colleges. So they would split the country. They'd have one representative essentially for 1.5 million Europeans that would live there and another for the 9 million Muslims that are there. So that, that's, their, that's their plan is to split everything up. And that passes by, you know what, a small minority in France. They actually agree to it. Um, and so at this point, 1947, so we're coming to the end of the period that we're looking at, uh, Muslims are now finally fully considered French citizens and they can go and work and work in France. So that's what a lot of them do. Um, the military territories that the French have established, they're all abolished. Arabic becomes the principal language. But again, the French decide, you know what, <laughs> this isn't in our favor. So they just start to rig the elections. Um, in their own favor and the laws that they've promised they're not really enacted and the argument for that being is is that because the Algerians can go and work now in France a lot of them are doing that but they're not keeping the money in France they're just sending it home to Algeria how dare you look after your family exactly <laughs> so uh. <laughs> you've got 350,000 Algerians working in France and they're all sending their money home so France is like well no that's no good so what that means is that there all of this build up leads to uh, a nationalist movement which happens around 1950 which is when we're you know our period ends and so I won't go much further beyond here but the, the war of independence is fought four years later 1954 so during at this period that we're going to be looking at it's all really it's good times, bad times, a bit of a roller coaster, but it's building up towards the actual uh, War of Independence. And that's, that continues until 1962, so eight years. And so in 1962, the negotiations end, the, the conflict finishes, Algerians get their independence, and the French leave. <laughs> So what else is happening 
in 1940 to 1950. Any any ideas oh, what might be happening? Even, even I have got some sort of anchor <laughs> points for this one. Uh, I'm going to guess World War II is Correct. a big feature of this globally even. That's all right. So Germany is invading Europe. It's blitzing London. Uh, the Japanese are attacking Pearl Harbor, um, bringing the US into the war. Italy is surrendering. D-Day landings are happening. Uh, World War II ends, concentration camps are liberated, and America decides to drop two atomic bombs on Japan, killing over 200,000 civilians. In other news, uh, 1946 in New York, uh, a 19-year-old girl called Pearl is hired by a man to take a photo of a woman with a hidden camera, which he tells her is an x-ray camera. So she follows this woman into Times Square Station, and she takes this surreptitious picture, but as she takes the picture, she blows the woman's leg off. Uh, because this x-ray camera that this guy had given her to take a picture of was actually a sawed-off shotgun, which he'd hidden in a gift wrap box. And it was basically, he was her murderous ex-husband. So that was happening You're gonna in 1946. You're going to have to go through that whole thing again. So, well, I have rigged up what appears to be a camera, but is secretly a shotgun. Yeah, a sawed-off shotgun, yeah. And I say to a passing, a passerby? No, no, no. He put an advert out for someone that she thought she was basically being like a private detective. Oh, sneaky photographer wanted. Yeah. Go and take this sneaky, sneaky picture. X-ray, x-ray picture. X-ray, x-ray picture. <laughs> yeah, that's, specifically. That's a curious detail to it add, is. but yeah. all right. <laughs> Uh, and then this person goes, this looks very much like a camera and not at all like a shotgun. <laughs> With a uh, trigger that's shaped just, just that, like a... Yeah, just pull, the, you know, it's the flash. There is a flash, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> and then they... Sh- so... It's a flash of a time. I have yeah. so many questions about this. Um, mostly, what kind of photographer was this who took a photo of someone... And shot them in the leg. What kind of photo was the? That's not going to come well, out. Was, I was thinking that. I think it's because it was a surreptitious photo, right? She's just trying to. She's probably not even looking. Like, oh, I'm looking over here, but actually, I'm pointing the camera. Camera in quotes over there. But also, how do you disguise a camera? <laughs> shotgun as a camera. Oh my just gosh! A this, this, with, a, with a gun in it. This has left me with so many more questions. <laughs> but I will allow you to continue. Thank you. 1948 <laughs> in England. Uh, The president for the National Society for the Retention of Corporal Punishment in Schools, you know, whipping children when they've been bad, is invited to speak at a British school for boys. Um, During the talk, a group of the boys creep up behind him, pin him down and beat him with his own canes. (laughs) (laughs) The headmaster had organised it. Uh, because he was anti-corporal punishment and he wanted the man, he, he wrote, I wanted the man to experience caning for himself. Well, total success, I would say. Yeah. yeah. Did the man change his tune after that, I wonder? I think it's unlikely, but he was in the papers. So there you go. Uh, inventions. There's a period of cool inventions. You've got the colour TV invented. Peter Goldmark invents that. You've got Jacques Cousteau inventing the aqualung and therefore scuba diving. So if you've ever been scuba diving, this is the period where Jacques Cousteau invented it. Uh, you've got George de Mestrel. You know what he invented? The Mestrelator. Velcro. Oh. It appears at this time. Uh, what about Hilton Tupman? Do you know what? Uh, I don't know if it's a he or a... kind? <laughs> you think so, yeah. Hilton Tupman. No, Hilton Tupman invents a portable pedestrian horn uh, to honk at poor motorists so you know how like if you're driving a car and somebody pulls out in front of you you can honk your horn well you can't do that if you're a pedestrian so why not carry the pedestrian horn with you uh which was loud enough to be heard within a one mile radius that seems like a gigantic overkill (laughs) but i want one (laughs) (laughs) okay and the other thing that was invented was the shocking stockings which I'm sure you've probably got a pair of. Uh, these... I've definitely got a pair of shocking stockings, but <laughs> maybe a different thing. I don't know. These are pantyhose, tights in the UK, uh, designed to repel mice. So these are fine spun copper mesh connected to batteries, which were placed inside the shoes. <laughs> wires ran through the stockings to a coil of wires in the girdle that the, the woman well, would wear. Obviously, be wearing a girdle. Battery. And then when a mouse brushed up against the pantyhose, <laughs> the circuit closed Strong voltage kills the rodent with no danger to the wearer. And I'm, I'm curious as to the problem that this was solving. <laughs> there were mice around. That many mice that they were always rubbing up against you. <laughs> You've seen Tom and Jerry. I forever, have, I like, suppose. Clambering up on chairs and getting away from all the mice. Mice must have been a big problem. Or alternatively, this was just code for men with creepy hands. I mean, 
It's a fetish I didn't know I had. <laughs> well, good news. I've got some shocking stockings on. So feel free at any point to just reach across and grab me by the thigh. I mean, in the modern, well, probably in the 70s, it would have been a fairly useful invention, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm sure it was happening before the 70s, people grabbing people. Anyway, so there you go. Those are the shocking stockings and the pedestrian horn and a bunch of other stuff. Oh, that's really helped already. Me. Thank you very much. That's all right. But we're not here to talk about it, crazy inventions and other news stories. We're here to talk about nature in oh, Algeria. Yeah, I forgot that, actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was so entranced in all that, I forgot. <laughs> I know. <the> point. <laughs> yes, the, the, the whole point of this is to talk about nature in Algeria during that period. So that's what we're going to talk about. And we're going to talk about some distinct regions within Algeria. It's kind of split up into these four. So in the north, you've got what's called the Tell Atlas. In the middle, you've got the High Plateau uh, in the south, you've got the Sahara Atlas, and then there's the northern Sahara Desert. And so we're going to talk through each of those in turn. So let's talk about the Tell Atlas. So the northern edge of Algeria is 1,008 miles of Mediterranean coastline. It's really pretty. Lots of sandy beaches, coves, that sort of stuff. Blue water, as you would imagine, from the Mediterranean. It's a relatively shallow coast. So if we're standing in the water... Um, and we're looking south, back to the beach, and we're going to head south, almost as the crow flies. We're just going to walk on our little journey south. So uh, we're in the water, having a little paddle. Uh, it's the it's a shallow coast of around about up to 130 meters, which isn't specifically very deep uh, water. There are in the water with us is almost 17,000 marine species. Wow, it's quite a lot. Um, this is the kind of stuff you might expect in the med. Uh, you've got dolphins, orca, turtles. Orca? Yeah. I always think of orca as cold water peoples. Yeah, I was surprised too. But no, they 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 have them right there. There's turtles, tuna, uh, octopus. You might you might have swimming around your feet. And of course, sharks. Dum dum mm. dum dum. I'm very pro octopus. I'm nervous around sharks. Well, you'll be fine because there's only been one recorded shark attack in Algeria. It was fatal, uh, but it was in 1844. It was uh, just, means due, just means we're due. Just means we're due, Ryan. <laughs> You'd be that one person. I'd be like, ah, oh, I knew it. I knew I shouldn't be out here. <laughs> yeah, 200 years later. <laughs> yeah. One every 200 years, they told me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we've crawled out of the water and we're now on the beach. Uh, beaches are considered among the best. Why do we crawl out of the water? Can't I walk out? I can't walk out. Shark attack. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so yeah, uh, considered it's among the best in Africa, um, by, I guess, Algerians. <laughs> <laughs> Algerian tourist board says officially the best. <laughs> yeah. They are largely underdeveloped at this point. Um, so 1940, 1950, there's, you know, there's no, in fact, they're kind of underdeveloped now. There's a few areas that have been sort of built up. There's one specific place called the Turquoise Coast, um, which is called out on TripAdvisor and Google as being the place to go if you want lovely blue waters and lovely sand that's all manicured and looked after. I feel like the marketing department has been involved in the turquoise coast there. <laughs> yes, exactly. Although I, I am reading that, that a lot of the, the other beaches are tourist traps and covered in rubbish and not ideal. So there's it's sort of a mix of reviews online as to... Uh, what to expect if you turn up at one of these beaches. Um, you might find along the beach cypress trees, cork oaks and olive trees. Those tend to be the, the more common ones just along the beach, um, you know, in amongst the sand, um, sandy dunes. So it's very Mediterranean. Those are Mediterranean things, aren't it's they? Exactly. Portugal is famous for its cork and... Cypress tree and olive trees. Olive yeah. trees are kind of Greece. I think of it as Greece and that sort of area. You, you can think of this northern part, the, the Tell Atlas, as being almost exactly Mediterranean, so Turkish or, you know, Italian coast, that sort of thing. Um, inland, we're going in a little bit further inland now, um, and these are now the coastal plains, I guess, where they were once water and, uh, you know, they're now just areas that are mineral rich. So you've got red, rich red soil, um, which is usually the result of the Mediterranean climate. So it's all warm, dry summers, mild, rainy winters, you know, classic sort of seaside affair. Um, it's the same latitude as California. So if, you, if you've ever been to California and that sort of weather, it's almost exactly the same in Algeria there. Well, the top top bit anyway. I always think of California as being south of them that, but I guess not. It is not. 
No, exactly the same latitude. So to the right of this, to the east, um, is healthy forests, uh, abundant vegetation. This is like the, the really healthy area where you want to grow. You've got colonization sort of started putting in vineyards and orchards and citrus groves. This is your bread market basket, gardens isn't it? And That's your bread basket. It's all, all over there towards the east. To the west, most of that starts to disappear. Um, the forests are gone and plants are really only growing if you've got irrigation. So that's where you might find more of the animals. Bit scrubby, is it? Bit scrubby, yeah. So this entire area along uh, yeah, that strip of, of the coastline uh, is known as the Tell. Don't know why. Couldn't find out why. Uh, and it's where 90% of the population live. 90% of all the Algerians live in this one strip of, of land right by the coast. Um, so it's rural and urban. Um, and there is a fault line that runs through all of this. It causes severe earthquakes occasionally. Um, but they have destroyed towns in the past. And uh, luckily, in our period, there is no earthquake that is destructing anything. Perhaps a little wobble, but that's about it. So we're going to continue to keep heading south. So we're heading more inland now. And the land is starting to rise up. And the soil turns brown. It goes from that red colour to a more brown colour. And that's from centuries of evergreen forests growing uh, on these inclines uh, as we start to head up towards mountains. Um, the forests now, uh, and by now I mean 1940s, 1950, cover just about 2% of the land. Previously, um, that had halved uh, from the 1830s, where about 50,000 square kilometres um, to, to about 24,000 square kilometres, 4,500 square miles of forest now just completely cut down to about 2% of the land. So I guess the French came in and were just stripping out all the wood is what I'm getting from that. Probably Ikea. Or Ikea. Yeah, got to get the wood from somewhere. Uh, the forest now, if we're, you know, 1940s, we're, we're wandering through. The, you're going to find holm oak, cork oak, juniper trees. So it's all evergreeny kind of stuff um, as well up there. Uh, the old woodlands are now scrubland. So where the, where the woods used to be, uh, you've got these aromatic, hard-leaved shrubs, um, things like rosemary, thyme. Uh, you might find those up there, laurel. Parsley sage? Yeah. No, that actually is on the poorer soil, which is slightly <laughs> over where you, you do get like sage, lavender, gorse, those sort of things in, in the areas where the trees are, are long gone. So the plants are getting sort of squatter and tougher aren't they <laughs> they are exactly yeah well i guess they've got to because they're you know it's just poorer soil right we're continuing inland south and we're now entering what is the tell atlas mountain range so this is where that fault line is so two billion years ago the african and the eurasian tectonic plates these are the plates that make up the earth the crust of the earth they collide together they smash into each other and they push the ground up and form two parallel mountain ranges the first is the tell atlas which is what we are now reaching on our journey inland and then there's the saharan atlas which is just beyond that so two rows of mountain ranges so all of these combined are the atlas mountains is that that's correct one? okay so those two parallel strips of mountain ranges the tell and the saharan make up the atlas mountains gotcha yes and uh, they both run parallel with the coast uh, east to west and they run the 932 miles distance right from tunisia all the way to morocco so and they are literally a barrier both of them just distinct walls of mountains to get past so one of the mountains uh, on this on the range on the tell atlas mountains uh, and number seven on the trip advisor list of places to visit in algeria is Pic du Sange. Any Peak idea what that means? Blood? No. Pic du Sange. Sange is monkey. Oh. Monkey mountain. Monkey mountain. Monkey mountain. Yeah, you go to Algeria. Tell me about monkeys. I love a monkey. Well, here we go. So uh, Monkey Mountain overlooks the coastline port of Beja. I'm probably saying that wrong, but it's got loads of weird little dots and stuff above it. So <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to pronounce it, but it's Beja. Beja. Bejaia or something. Anyway, it's... Uh, 
big tourist destination. Lots of people, lots of great reviews online saying, oh, it's a beautiful place. You can clamber all the way up there, look out over the sea, the beautiful sea you know, beneath. Uh, but as the name implies, it's also the home to the only native monkey in Algeria, the Barbary macaque or the Barbary ape, as you called it earlier. Besides humans, the macaques are the only free-living primates in Europe. By free-living, do you mean they're like hippies? Well, not in a zoo. Oh, right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> free-living, like, had an outlook around. that was a bit more... Peace and love. <laughs> well, in a way, they kind of are a bit hippie-ish. I'll come to why in a second. So uh, what does a macaque look like? Uh, they're about 25 inches, so 63 centimetres long. Uh, they have yellowish, brown, greyish hair, and they can live up to about 30 years if they, I guess, look after themselves and eat right. Yep, eat diet and exercise. <laughs> yeah. I'm talking of eating, they eat mostly plants, insects. They'll eat pretty much any insect, scorpions and all sorts, um, shoving it in their mouths. Um, when they shove it in their mouths, they shove it into their cheek pouches, like little hamsters. Ah. Um, yeah. And in fact, those cheek pouches, are they can store as much in those as they can in their stomach. I would like a cheek pouch. I'd like a little food wallet that I could... When someone says... Because, you know, sometimes someone says, would you like a biscuit? And you're kind of full... But, but I'd you do want a biscuit, later. right? You could just pop it in your cheek pouch. Right. Job done. Yeah, unless it leaked out, like melted, and then that's not how my cheek pouch works. I've evolved, Ryan, to <laughs> maximise the value cool. of my biscuit, like a refrigerated, yeah, a refrigerated cheek, cheek pouch. pocket. Yeah, I'd forget something and it'd go off, and then I'd get like infected and it'd be horrible. <laughs> They'd have to remove it, and I'd have no cheek. <laughs> Can you imagine? Mother's like, you've got, you've left something in your cheek pouch again, haven't you? Yeah. <laughs> what is this? No, no, mum. They live in troops of up to 100 individuals. So you can get lots of them all just hanging around, which is, I guess, why people sort of go there and, and have a look at them on uh, Pique du Songe. They have a queen, or rather like a lead female. And uh, what she does is she sort of determines the hierarchy of the troop. So you're the worst. You're the best. You're great. Oh, you're imagine terrible. queen monkey's like, yeah. So it's like being picked at gym class. Exactly. <laughs> you are the worst monkey. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure I've been called the worst the monkey wor before. You're a bad monkey. I'm really starting to relate to these guys. <laughs> <laughs> well, how about this then? Girl monkeys will mate with the majority of the males in the troop. I can respect that. They sleep around. And because the males don't know whose kid it is, uh, they usually play, well, they play an unusual role in rearing all of the young. So the males get involved in looking after all the kids, um, spending their time basically grooming and playing and being a, 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 a papa. It's a solid system. I like all the it. Babies. Well, that's the thing. They might also do this because it seems that females prefer males who are good parents. So I don't know whether or not it's... I just want to hang out with my kid and so I'll just hang out with all the kids or it's I also want to just get laid and this is a great way of getting laid. Well, I've got to say, this is basically good advice for humans anyway, isn't a it? A little of column A, <laughs> a little of column B. In any event, <laughs> yeah. help out, be nice, things will work out better for you. That's right. Hello and welcome to The Barbara Show. My guest today's relationship with her mother has broken down completely and we're going to find out why. First off, let's meet the mother. What's the story? Well, Barbara, my daughter is refusing to sleep around. Mm. That's right. She's just saying she wants to sleep with one monkey. One monkey? For life? For life, Barbara. Well, it sounds like she's gone bananas. <laughs> and I'm here today to tell her that if she doesn't stop putting it about and, and bringing a few strange monkeys home, I'm kicking her out of the troop. Well, let's see what she has to say. Come on in, Betty. But, listen, Matt, I don't care. You don't know me. I'm a one-man monkey. I'm a monoga monkey. And you can't talk. You ain't exactly queen of the swingers. I've slept with more monkeys than you've had hot dinners. I've never had hot dinners. I'm a monkey. You know what I mean. All right, all right, everyone. You have to calm down, calm down. Betty, you say you've only been seeing one guy? Yeah, Barry. He's my boo, my one and only. Well, Barry's here today, so let's bring him out.
Now oh, shut up, all of you. I love you, babe. All right, so Barry, Betty's got something she has to say to you. That's right. Barry, I'm pregnant. <gasps> oh, well, uh, I've got something I have to tell you. I'm seeing someone else. <gasps> you scumbag! You said you love me! And they're here today. Let's bring out Billy Bob. I love Billy Bob and Billy Bob loves me. I do. Don't you worry, love. We'll get you a dozen better than that scumbag. OK, we're going to the break and when we come back we'll be meeting Selena, who's been touched by a tourist on Monkey Mountain. Uh, so, predators. Domestic dogs. Oh, well, that's a shame. Yeah, main predator is the domestic dog. Uh, in the 1940s, however, which is, of course, our, our point, they are also going to want to keep an eye out for leopards and eagles. Lots of those hanging around. Oh, imagine being grabbed by an eagle. That must be horrendous. Not great. Well, you get to fly before you die. I'm guessing I like, grabbed wow, by a leopard I can see my cool. house from here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, less fun being grabbed by a leopard, I imagine. Uh, but there you go. So, uh, yeah, fewer of those um, now in Algeria, so probably less of a problem for the mubbing hacks. What's a bigger problem for the uh, for the Barbary apes is that their population is declining. Uh, there were, in 1940, about 100,000 of these across Algeria, and now there's just between 12 to 21,000 of them. So they're, they're really dropping off. Reason for that being uh, humans, because we're humans. Usually is. Yeah, the climate. Because of the climate, because of humans. <laughs> uh, macaques are sold as pets in uh, Morocco and Algeria, so you can go and buy one. Uh, they're exported to Europe, not just as pets, but to be used as fighting monkeys, which I found... I find myself really torn by that, because on the one hand, I'm horrified and I don't want it to happen. It should definitely be banned. Yeah. But a little bit of me wants to see it. <laughs> <laughs> but like only if I, you train them like in boxing <laughs> rather than just all-out combat. Well, it, the good news for you is that they, they obviously fight physically, but they also do online uh, monkey boxing. Um, so you can go on the dark web and watch some Barbary apes fighting it out. How are they with a tennis racket? Don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't even think about it. You can also find them in Gibraltar. For some reason, there is like a small colony of the Barbary ape in, in Gibraltar as well. I guess they were taken across there at some point. Yeah, they're they, very important in Gibraltar, aren't they? Yeah, back, back in the day, they were carried around sort of as gifts. The Romans brought them to Ireland and to a few of the other Celtic parts of the UK um, to trade for or just as gifts. I kind of want one, but they they are social creatures, presumably. If they live in troops of 100, they probably want to be with their family. Yeah, you just so, want one so you can keep your wallet in its little cheek pocket. You know, like, just go to pay something. Biscuit, and be like, Come on. <laughs> Give me my card. There's so many uses. Yeah. Uh, right. So we're in the mountains. Pic du Sange is in the mountains. We've gone up the mountains. We'll have a look at the little monkeys. And now we're heading up and over. Uh, we're at a height of around about 4,000 to 5,000 feet. So it's how, how, non, non insignificant. Is that like snowy 1,500 meters? Or is it just a very large hill. Very large hill. Right. Yeah. Uh, no, I mean, it, these are mountains. They're rocky, but it's. There's not snow it's yet. Not an Alp. No, it's not an Alp. No, uh, and so yeah, as we've discussed, the mountains are forming like this natural barrier. They're high enough that the climate doesn't go past it. It sort of just stops at the mountain, um, which is obviously why the north of Algeria is so lush and and lovely, and beyond that, not so much. So we'll talk about that. So and that's the direction we're heading is south. So we crest over the top of the mountain range and we head down south on the other side and enter. The High Plateau. Sounds like a book in like some fantasy novel. I was thinking it sounds like a, a sort of Western from the 1970s. Okay, yeah. That would be like a name of a plateau starring John Wayne. Yeah. High Plateau. Anyway, it's not. It's in Algeria. <laughs> <laughs> so we've come, down the, uh, we've come down the mountain and all that warm weather and everything has stayed on the other side of the mountain. And now we're in a place of extreme temperatures. So it is super hot in the summer. It is super cold in the winter. And there is little rain on this side of the mountain. And this results in what is essentially like a, um, what would have been, I guess, a valley at some point. But is now just this long, level, grassy plain, just with covered in scrub and bushes. There's really not a tremendous amount there. When it does rain, 
large, uh, what are called sabkas. Um, they form their shallow salt lakes. Sabka. Sabka, yeah. Mm-hmm. And they, they, yeah, the salt lake. And so you can't even drink the water. Uh, and it makes farming almost impossible because nothing grows where it's all salty water. Uh, nothing that, you know, that we can use anyway. But to the credit and the ingenuity of man, there are some people there that, and they're gathered around the sort of the more better watered areas. Uh, bearing in mind, this strip runs the entire length of the Tell Mountains, right? So this is another thousand miles of this. So there are some areas where you can actually uh, graze your sheep and your goats. Um, You can even do a little bit of farming. So things like wheat, barley, oats, olives, dates, those sort of things. You can grow those bit of tobacco maybe. Uh, In the ground, we've got huge quantities of iron, zinc, lead and mercury this is 1940 1950 this is where people start to come in and be like "Hmm, we should dig this out of the ground you've got traces of tin nickel cobalt chrome and uranium yeah and so you've got all this commercial mining starts in this area in the high plateau i'm curious about mercury because obviously mercury sort of dribbles around (laughs) it does do you just sort of pick up the rock and it falls out how does that work (laughs) that's a really good question hello this is the voice of the internet. Most mercury forms in a sulfide ore called cinnabar. The most common pyrometallurgical extraction for mercury from the ore is by distillation. First the ore is crushed and then heated in a furnace at a temperature above boiling point. Oxygen combines with sulfur to form sulfur dioxide, and the metal is vaporized. The vapor is then condensed into liquid mercury. Thank you. Uh, to the east of the plateau, to the right, I'm glad you do that for me. I know. You know I have to, I have to <laughs> meld my brain to, to try and make that work. But yes, to the right are the Ores Mountains, which are basically where the Tell Atlas and the Saharan Atlas, those two parallel lines converge and they create what's known as the Ores Mountains. Uh, and it's shared half, almost half and half with Tunisia. The, the land boundary goes runs right through the Ores Mountains. In that area is the Belizma National Park. So let's tell you a bit about the Belizma National Park. Uh, It has pastures and forests and grasslands and thickets and rivers and loads of caves where I guess people used to live in the old days. Um, It is a cool and groovy green area. One of the few areas in this place that you might be able to actually have a funky time. It's home to the Atlas Cedar Tree. Uh, which you might know from sort of essential oils and it's used in that sort of stuff. But it's big, high, evergreen, up to 40 meters high. These wow. things can grow super big, two meters in diameter, you know, the trunk. They're, they're big. I mean, cedars are wood used in woodworking as well, isn't it? I'm, I've got a feeling. I guess so, yeah. But it is on the threatened species list uh, due to climate change, principally. So they're starting to lose quite a few of these trees. But this area, the Belizma National Park, is the site of one of the last sightings of the Barbary lion. Now, this is a a now extinct lion uh, that survived in small groups up until the 1960s. So during our period, probably a couple of Barbary lions still... Oh man, running around around going, have you seen anyone else? Yeah, it's just done something. It's heartbreaking. It is heartbreaking, yeah. And so uh, from sort of the late 1800s, bounties were placed on the the lions and were being paid if you could, as a hunter, could go and kill one. Uh, Mainly because... Food was becoming scarce within the mountains themselves, and so the lions were coming down and eating off all of the uh, livestock instead. Extinction of the Barbary Lions. Hey, Tarquin, I've got an idea. You know how we're hungry, like, all the time? Oh, yeah, yeah, I could totally murder a gazelle, (laughs) if I could find one. (laughs) (laughs) No, but seriously, what I was thinking, right, is that one should scamper down to the old farm and have a chit-chat with the little humans, see if they have any spare talk. Well, that is a bloody brilliant idea. They're practically swimming in goats down there. Surely they can spare us one. I know. Right, so I'll uh, head off then, shall I? Cheerio, old chap. Best of luck. Two days later. I say, whatever happened to Cecil? You know, I bet he's down there with those humans having a grand old time. You know what? I'm going to Ballywell go down there and join in the fun too. (laughs) 
I say hello. Hello, human. Extinction of the Barbary Lions. Uh, yeah, so they are light, tawny coloured rather than the sort of the more richer yellow colour that you might expect from African lions. Uh, they had long manes, um, which is supposed to have kept them warm, I think, because of those cold uh, cold winters that they were suffering. Um, stuffed lions, our only real measure for these things now, um, is that they were measured head to tail up to three metres in length Yowzers, nine that's, feet that's a substantial that's bigger it's than me, you me and, and a half a big lad it's me and a half wow yeah some hunters claim that they were even larger than that which hunters might do you know yeah, call yeah, like fishermen, right? <laughs> yeah they said that they might weigh up to 300 kilograms 700 pounds and you're not going to bench press one are you I'm de- no, they might bench press you <laughs> just for fun. They, you know, I mean, it sounds like they were big and it makes sense. Like, you know, if they were left alone and weren't being hunted and, you know, they've got enough food, why wouldn't they just get as big as they can get? They were top of the chain for a while, right? They sure were. But you know what? Let's get out of the high plateau. Okay. I'm you know why? I've got to move on. Well, not just that. The Sirocco is causing you a right old pain. You can barely see. Oh, the stupid Sirocco. Sirocco. Isn't that a Volkswagen? It was a Volkswagen, it was a type of car, yeah. Uh, but the Sirocco is a dusty wind, uh, which blows up from the south. Super annoying. Often at gale force, so basically, you know, a gale force. But with dust. Dust wind. <laughs> like, yeah. On the plus side, you just, could, if you wanted to sand anything down, you could just leave it out in the Sirocco. <laughs> yeah, just not just yourself. <laughs> Come back all shiny. Uh, yeah, so we're going to leave there pretty quickly. All right, got to go. Sirocco is whipping you. See ya, Sirocco. Whipping and we are now heading towards the Saharan Atlas Range. Mm. So as we leave the plateau, we look through the dust storm and we see rising out of the ground ahead of us a collection of mountainous ranges. More mountains. Yeah. So this is makes up the Saharan Atlas Mountains, these ones that run parallel to the Tell Mountains. Um, you've got Kasur in the west, Amur in the middle, and Uled Nayel to the east. Again, apologies to those people that are wincing at my interpretation of how we to pronounce to do these. Every week, don't we? We're so sorry everyone. We're just so sorry. We suck at this. <laughs> yeah. Then you've also got the Hodna and the Nemepcha and the Zab Mountains as well. So all of these are collections of mountain ranges that block your path from heading south. And they run continuously east to west in a parallel. Thousand of miles of this is it? Oh yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll There's, go round. You can't go round. <laughs> <laughs> or under you got to go over. So this is the Saharan Atlas Range. And these are more imposing summits than the last ones, than the uh, the Tell Atlas. Um, some here are now, you've almost doubled the height. You've got an almost 8,000 feet high. Some of these. You make it over the first ones. Oh, come on. Yeah. Now you've got another <laughs> row. Yeah. On the plus side, though, as you're clambering up these mountains, uh, you're getting more rainfall. Uh, this is actually one of the better areas, better suited to agriculture here than the high plateau. So there are people living in this area, too. But they're mostly the Berbers. As we're climbing the mountains, you want to keep an eye out for wild dogs and leopards. I they always in- like to keep an eye out for wild dogs and leopards. They inhabit this this particular range of mountains. It's just um, basic travel advice, isn't it? You do. Just watch out for wild dogs and leopards. <laughs> the first thing my mother sold me (laughs) yeah uh yeah and so we descend down the other side of the mountains and we discover that what we've just reached having crossed two sets of mountain ranges and the high plateau is the northernmost edge of the sahara desert (laughs) and ahead of us is 1000 miles of desert 1600 kilometers of desert so let's get going um can i bring some water no darn it no water for you. You can bring yourself. Come in. And I'm ready. Cheery grin. Ready to walk. <laughs> Got me Crocs on. <laughs> That's a terrible idea. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about the Sahara then. Because of the Tell Atlas and the Saharan Atlas... We've got this double barrier, which is preventing the Mediterranean climate from coming any further. And as a result, the annual rainfall in the Sahara falls to below less than four inches a year. It's like a sort of double filter, isn't it? (laughs) Yeah. And this is just the first strip right after the after the mountain. So we find ourselves in a stony desert. Right. This isn't this isn't the classic sand dunes. This is just a stony desert. There's nothing really there. It's uh, grizzly. It's hot. 
and there's very little water. We're in what is called the Umzab. This is what this region is called, the Umzab. And it's sort of like this strip, a bit like the high plateau just after the Saharan land. So oh, these nothing good in it. <laughs> no. Well, is there not? It's mostly arid ground, as we've said. There are old, dry riverbeds. Fun times if you want water. Um, but it does That's have... just a memory of water. <laughs> it's not memory of water. Thing. Well, this is the thing. It, it, the Mzab does have some of the Sahara's largest oases. Oasis is... Oases? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't settle on this. <laughs> I'm going to go with oases. Oases, yeah, I think so. And because of these large oases, you've got towns that are built up around them. Uh, wherever there's water, right? People will gather. And so you've got these five towns that have been built since the 11th century. And there, there are, there are 4,000 water wells that are in these cities. And it's said that when they're all pulled, the sound of the pulleys sings the song of Umzab. Ooh, Isn't that nice? Lovely. Yeah. But we're in the 40s right. and that means electricity. And so people are bringing electric pumps along. And so that song of Mzab is now slowly turning into the hum of Mzab. <laughs> the Mzab. Oh, how long did you work on that? I haven't written that down. I just made it up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so they're using that water and they're using that to irrigate the land and to grow certain things. And so you've actually got, against the odds, miles and miles of palm groves um growing dates beautiful dates so let's talk about dates uh you got one tree one um date palm can you can harvest 180 kilograms of dates it's half a barbary lion (laughs) (laughs) it's just gonna be your new france what's that in barbary Barbary lion (laughs) measure yeah so you can grow a lot of a lot of dates which is good news because uh, there's lots of people eating dates uh, in this area in Algeria date facts I'm so excited <laughs> date facts <laughs> date facts <laughs> I'm really I mean I can't even put into words the trepidation I'm feeling right now Ron, regarding date facts date but facts. please continue <laughs> you're gonna love this date facts uh you're gonna be telling people this in time you'll be like is this gonna be my go-to date yeah. <laughs> date <laughs> date opener on a date. date facts date eh? facts on works, a date double works twice okay <laughs> a date one date contains 68 percent sugar it's a lot of sugar it's a lot of sugar right no wonder they're so popular super sweet uh, they're also really nutritious they contain vitamin a b and d and when mixed with camel milk which has fat and vitamin c in it it gives you a complete meal but if you don't have camel milk, you can just eat 15 dates a day, which it said gives you all the minerals and vitamins an adult body needs. So just eat 15 dates a day. I feel that would have consequences. Yeah, it's not a diet I'd recommend <laughs> to many people, but I think it's one of those you could do, <laughs> don't. Imagine all that sugar, you'd have no teeth left for a start. Yeah. Anyway, Pete, are you allergic to dates? I am not. Do you know anyone who is? I don't know. I've never really... No. Do you know why? Because they're hypoallergenic. Very few people are actually allergic to dates. So that if anyone tells you they're allergic to dates, look at them with squinted eyes and go, you liar. All right, I'll bear that in mind. I mean, it hasn't come up much in my life so far, but it's good to <laughs> Moving know. Moving on. I'll file that. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the word date comes from the Greek word dactylos, meaning finger. <laughs> uh, south, oh, oh no, one last date fact. Please do. According to Islamic tradition, Dates and the date palm uh, was the tree of life in the Garden of Eden, which I think, given the fact that, you know... Plausible, isn't it? It's a, that was kind of the area. source of nutrition in roughly that area, maybe. Yeah, exactly. And given it's their tree of life, right, it's the thing that's keeping their communities going. Yeah, it makes sense. The tree of life. There you go. So south of Mzab, we're heading south now. We're past all this bit and we're now into classic desert territory. Is it wrong that I've got uh, that Hanson song in my head now? Go, zub, dip it up, zub, dip it up, I'm just glad you've said it on this rather than wait until we have to do a sketch and then <laughs> recommend that we both sing um zub. That is not going to happen. No. Right. So we're now into yeah into the classic desert territory. Uh, these are vast sand dunes. Right. Um, these are called ergs. 
Ooh. I didn't know that, but that's the official name for a sand dune desert, a sand sea or a dune sea you might have heard of, otherwise known as an erg. So that that's the whole, the whole area rather than area. an individual dune, isn't it? it? Yeah, an erg is an area of sand or sandy dunes that cover more than 48 square miles. Wow. So yeah, anything like 47 square miles, not an erg. It's just a Sorry, pit. fella. <laughs> <laughs> Can't. Sorry, mate. Can't be an erg. It's got to be forty-eight square miles, mate. That's only forty-seven. I don't make the rules. <laughs> yeah. Now, as it turns out, uh, these ergs. And there are a few of these ergs in the Sahara. They are way bigger than forty-eight square meters. And I say way bigger because I wrote way in capital That's letters. In big letters. Yeah, with a couple extra Y's at the end as well. It's that big. So the Sahara. In total, bearing in mind that not all of it is in Algeria, most of it is though, uh, the, Sah- the Sahara in total is approximately the same size as the United States. What? Just slightly smaller than China. That's really, really big. <laughs> it's really, really big. Yeah. And 80% of the Sahara, so you've got the United States, 80% of the United States is in Algeria, which blows my brain. Uh, so we're talking 3.5 million square miles of of desert that's 9.2 million square kilometers and 20 percent of that is sand so only 20 only 20 percent of that is sand what's the rest it's rock and scrubland wow yeah so is this a ma- one of those things where basically there's not really anything there so no one wanted it so it might as well be algeria as anywhere else i think that's almost exactly the case yeah, like yeah. who's invading really he's like oh we're gonna want your Empty space. <laughs> yeah. So 700,000 square miles of sand wow. in Algeria, uh, which is, I've done the maths, <laughs> approximately 1.5 septillion grains of sand. What's a septillion? Pete, do you know? Oh, it's just loads. It's a lot. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Moving on. <laughs> it's a trillion trillion or 24 zeros. So, so if I said, go and count them for me, yeah. how long would it take you? One at a time. Uh, well, a long time. One at a time. Have to put a number on each one as you go, so you didn't do it twice. <laughs> it, would, <laughs> it would take me a long time. Uh, it's as many stars as there are in the observable universe. Stars. Which gives you an idea. If every star's got several planets, several septillion. Anyway, point is, there's a lot of sand. So where does the sand come from, Pete? I think it's ground down out of rock. Oh, that's what I thought. I thought it was a load of rocks rubbing against each other and created sand. Not so. Sand comes from soil. It, it comes from a combination of uh, sand, silt and clay, which are the sort of the three minerals that you'll find in soil. Obviously, there's other more organic stuff that's decayed down, but those are the three sort of stuff that you'll find. And without water, the soil dries out and the minerals can't bind together. And because silt and clay particles are smaller and lighter... When the wind blows, they blow away, leaving the just the sand and pebbles behind. Yeah. Now, obviously, I think there's probably an element where they do then rub the pebbles and those probably wear away as well. But principally, that's where the sand in the Sahara is coming from. And because the wind is generally consistent, the the grains of sand then become roughly the same size. They become like a uniform pattern. That's why you don't oh. get larger sized grains of sand. Anyway, that's where the Sahara sand comes from. Another indication that it was this beautiful green lush place at some point with loads of soil. All of that has gone. So uh, another question for you. What's underneath the sand other than giant worms? <laughs> <laughs> um, obviously rock. Rock. That's exactly right. Yeah. Uh, rock is, is it. it's a solid platform. It's described as a solid platform of horizontal rock. Super boring. It's just, there's there's not a lot of stuff going on. It's just big old platform of rock. So there's basically no water table because there's just solid rock and then solid rock. sand. Yeah. And then occasionally you might get a spring or something that pops up wow. with a, forming an oasis. But that's about it. Yeah. What's underneath the rock? Lava. <laughs> uh, Dinosaurs. Uh, no, petroleum. Oh. And natural gas. Oh. There's a lot of that, apparently. I see problems. <laughs> well, it's just difficult to get to because it's just so hot. And, you know, we're we're talking, I mean, ergs are extremely hot and dry. We're talking Sahara Desert. So daytime temperatures are 51 degrees Celsius, 122 Fahrenheit. Uh, It is literally the hottest place on Earth during the height of summer. Don't go there during the height of summer. 
less than 50 millimeters of rainfall. That's just over two in or just under two inches of rainfall a year. If they're lucky, rain can just disappear for up to five years. No rain at all. So in that you can understand why it's entirely barren, this area. Huge area. You know, 80% of the United States just sand and rock. And so it's uninhabited. Like obviously there's not many people yes not metropolises <laughs> shooting up there uh you've got wandering nomads with their camel trains See, that, wandering along that's what blows that's my mind about it a wandering even having a wandering nomad that's mind blowing yeah just walking along going i'm just gonna go over there now it's a thousand miles of just <laughs> sand and dryness <laughs> it might rain this year possibly next year i don't know <laughs> yeah it's sand it's coarse gets everywhere they say that they do uh, so there are only a few tiny oases, you know, if you do find one oasis, you're lucky enough, you might find date palms, acacia trees, wild olives, you know, it's a sort of scrub basically. So if you're wandering the desert and you're lost and you find an oasis, mm-hmm. you just stop there and just hope someone comes along at some point. You don't strike out again, presumably. Well, it depends. And we'll, we'll come to, we'll come to what to do if you come across an oasis shortly, but oases, if you're in a migrating bird and you're flying from parts of Africa all the way to Europe, you might want to stop and have a drink at some point. And Definitely. if you're flying across the Sahara, very few places. So from above, you've probably got a better view than you have as if you're on the ground as to where these oases are. And so they tend to stop and have a little drink. So they'll they'll find. So, you know, if you're if you are stuck in the desert, follow have a little birds. follow a bird. Yeah. However, you might want to follow these birds for this particular reason, because some oases these birds land in are saltier than the sea. Super salty oh, water. Can you imagine the so they, heartbreak? I've made it. Right. Well, this is the thing. Right. This is amazing. I love this. So the, the birds fly down. They drink the water and die in the water. And this attracts flies. Swarms of flies. Like beyond, you know, like you can't see in front of your hand, you know, your hand in front of your face. Swarms of flies. But the other birds that are migrating after the ones that have died fly down and eat the bugs that have been living oh. off the dead birds and the the bugs become like this filter for the water so they get all this juicy bug juice which is full of water and that's what they replenish themselves on for it's their journey cycle of life it's amazing right so so those but so birds, don't be the first bird don't be the first bird <laughs> be like hey there's an oasis down there let's go hey you guys if you want to check that out that'd be amazing yeah yeah amazing anyway so what you might also find around an oasis uh gazelles hyenas gazelles that yeah. just seems so big for a yeah, right? such a dry area yeah but i guess if they know where the water is and they're used to it oh, part of their migration routes or whatever hyenas where i guess where there are gazelles jackals can be found leopards and cheetahs um becoming less common 1940 you know they were being hunted but you know they're still you still find them if you're unlucky enough to stumble <laughs> across one in the desert uh you might be luckier to find little gerbils though little cute gerbils Scrabbling around in the in the sand and the desert hare, little rabbits, you know, type creatures jumping about. Uh, mostly, you'll find swarms of locusts. So if you're in the desert, you get caught in a swarm of locusts, scorpions, spiders, and snakes. Oh, plenty of those hanging around. You are not describing a good night out, my friend. And it doesn't get much better. What's one of the things you would least expect to find in the desert? Water-based creatures, some sort of uh, frog. Similar. Crocodile. Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> the West African crocodile, also known as the desert crocodile or the dessert crocodile, which I've written. <laughs> <laughs> loves ice cream. <laughs> the desert crocodile, it grows as large as four meters long. That's I mean, that's 13 just, feet long. It's just twice fair, of me. <laughs> it's so big. Yeah. And they've adapted to life in the desert. Uh, and they do this by living in caves so watch out if you there's a cave nearby and you fancy a little nap in there or burrows they burrow themselves in and they stay dormant like in a type of hibernation during those dry periods where there's very little water around and then when it does rain even when it rains they scoot out gather down by the oasis and prey on whatever hangs around so because i mean that's a good you know everyone's coming by right then it's the oasis it's the oasis exactly yeah there have been several attacks on humans I guess, because everyone's gathering around the same watering holes, including fatal ones. So people are, you know, nabbed by these things. A four metre long crop gets you. That's you know it. bad news, isn't it? It is pretty bad news, yeah. (laughs) 
So that brings us to surviving the desert. Let's try and... Uh, I do not fancy my chances. We've wandered, <laughs> we've wandered in. We're halfway in. Let's say we're 500 miles into right, the, the yeah. desert. We've, we've got that far. So, uh, but now we're, uh, we're stuck. We've, we've, we're, we're a bit lost and we don't know where we are. What do we do? First, what? what's the first thing we do? Firstly, I shall regret wearing Crocs. <laughs> yeah, that, I did warn you. That was a terrible <laughs> idea. <laughs> and that thong. That was a terrible yeah. idea. Yeah. Just Crocs in a thong. <laughs> Maybe some form of hat is in order. I don't know. Well, the first thing is stay calm. All right. There's no, I'm freaking out just hearing about no it. There's no point freaking out. Like, how bad can it be? <laughs> Seems quite bad. Yeah, it's really bad. Yeah. So you've got to think rationally, right? And you're only going to think rationally if you stay calm. So okay. deep breaths. Right. Deep breaths. That's it. Calm it down. Take a moment. Okay, I'm going to be fine. Okay, you're going to conserve energy. There's yep. no point you running around, screaming and shouting. Keep cool. Not literally cool, but yep. keep calm. Uh, and that means being slow, steady with movements, rest, that sort of stuff. That's all what right. I do, sleep, actually. Sleep, sleep. do that. Just try and keep cool and calm. It's good. All right. I've calmed you down already. Okay. I can feel it. going to be all right. Okay. Next thing, get water. Going to need water. In the heat of the desert... We can sweat, humans can sweat about one litre of water a day, a sweat a day. No problem. So Just pick myself up a litre of water a day. One litre a day. Yeah, exactly. Bit of Evian or something. No you problem. cannot survive in the desert for longer than three days without any water. Okay. Okay. So look for life, if you can, as we said, birds, uh, plants, insects, they can all lead you to water, but, you know, four metre long crocs. So watch out. If you do decide to just hang out at it's a Hobson's hotel. choice, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If you do, you know, you, you find yourself in a shaded area, uh, you might want to dig a hole in some of the shaded areas because they, they might be moist under there. Moist, any moisture is just sort of hung out in the shaded bits. So dig down there and then, I guess, lick the wet sand. <laughs> I don't, I guess. I'm willing to give it a go. Why not? <laughs> suck the sand. <laughs> in the morning, uh, if it's morning, lick the dew off a rock. Find a rock. Lick the dew. Okay, yeah, I'm game. Why not? I've got to survive. I've only got, got three survive. days. You've got three best. days of this. Yeah, exactly. Uh, find cover. I don't, yeah, I don't think you're going to find litres of, of water on a rock in dew, but <laughs> you know, some is better than none. Find cover is the next thing. Uh, if it's midday and the sun is out, uh, which it will be, you will cook, literally. So uh, it's going to mess you up. So walk at night if you're going to head out uh, or in the early morning, but don't walk during the day. Uh, wear clothes as you said wear a hat that's a really really great piece of advice especially your head always cover up covering up also includes uh, you know if you let's say you haven't got a hat or whatever you want to hide somewhere else or just get some get some sleep you might want to sleep under a plant might give you some shade but if you're going to do that you're going to want to beat the ground pretty hard to scare away any snakes or scorpions that are hiding under the plant because everyone they, else wants the everyone plant. else wants the shade too so yeah uh, yeah, some of the nomads, um, women put a small dab of scorpion poison on their nipples when they're feeding their young so that it sort of um, vaccinates them against scorpion stings. Wow. Later that in That is the fact of facts. Because I said nipple. No, poison, scorpion poison nipple. That's yeah. amazing. It's also a great name for a band, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Scorpion poison That's a heavy nipple. metal band that you would go see. <laughs> uh yeah okay um talking of nomads navigate by uh the wind during the day um, and by the stars at night that's how they get around Ooh. the winds during the day and the stars at night there is See, there I've is done an this old thing. saying who says that only a fool trusts his eyes in a landscape that never stops changing don't trust your eyes and in fact there are blind nomads that can navigate the sahara just by smell i can do that now croydon high street yeah sorry you were saying um no, the stars thing, I, that blows my mind because I've gone out into the countryside from time to time. Yeah. I'm a fundamentally <laughs> urban person, as you know. And I've looked up and gone, nope. Yeah, nope. I don't understand any of that. <laughs> <laughs> and then gone to Google Maps. So <laughs> I think I'm a dead man walking here. You're, you are not doing well. I mean, can you navigate by the wind? I'm pretty sure you can do that. I can, if it's at my back or not at my back, that's pretty much uh, the sum total. Should I be going with the wind or against the wind? That I don't know. So just... <laughs> 
I we'll could skip find over, myself we'll in the skip over again. I remember one thing and he didn't know which way I should be going. <laughs> doesn't matter. Just one way. Just pick a way. It's 50 50 at yeah, that I point. I suppose right? it's only a thousand miles each way, right? Yeah. But like, I like that though. You know, only a fool trusts his eyes in a landscape that never stops changing. Yeah, it's beautiful and terrifying. Just like true that. as well. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, the nomads, they're called the Turags. They've lived on the Sahara for about 2,000 years. Not the same group of people. They obviously get old and die and then new ones emerge. Traditional. Yeah. Uh, they say that you can survive. So let, let's say you found an oasis. And at this oasis, uh, it has a date palm there. Mm -hmm. And it's just got one date because all the birds have flown down and stolen it. One date is enough. It'll last you for nine days. And the way that they do it is they eat the skin of the date first, right? And they eat that over the course of three days, just the outside of the, the date. <laughs> oh, no. The next three days, they eat the meat of the date and then they suck the stone each day until day nine. And then they die. If you don't get fine more a water second date. Else. <laughs> or a second date. Never had yeah. a second date be more important <laughs> to somebody. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And then uh, smoke signals, uh, flashing sunlight uh, from a mirror, uh, using sticks and stones to try and spell out the word SOS. It sounds stupid, but like you're in the desert, you're going to die if you don't try something, right? So, um, you know, better that than nothing. Today will be my last day. Darling, if you find this, know that I love you for this will surely be my last note. The situation here is dire. Jones and I have been lost for days, the sun beating mercilessly upon our backs. No water to quench the raging thirst in... My hope is you live your life well without me and know that in my heart I... I know that in... In my, in my heart. Are you eating? No. I can hear you. I can hear you crunching. No. No, no, I'm not. Seriously, what are you eating? Sand. Sand? Yeah. Well, you, you can't eat sand. Oh, well, you can. It's, uh, it's all right, actually. R really? Yeah, yeah. I, I call it my sandwich because uh, it's it's sand, which is the only thing we have to eat. Oh. Well, can I have some? No. Oh. Okay. Today will be my last day. Darling, if you find this, know that I love you. For this will surely be. So, yeah, uh, if you do die, which let's just say you have done because you've tried all this stuff and it's not worked, you're in good company. Um, people die in the Sahara all the time. Algeria specifically has a history of turning away thousands of migrants every year, sending them back into the Sahara without even food or water. They just turn them away and send them back the way they came. Other than those, adventurers get lost, uh, cars break down, uh, planes crash. Um, there are people that just wander off into the desert and die. And about 2,500 years ago, uh, 50,000 warriors led by the Persian king Symbolis II, uh, walked into the desert and just disappeared. 50,000 of them. And in 2008, archaeologists think that they have found them. They found their remains. They found bronze weapons, a silver bracelet, an earring, and hundreds of bones in the Sahara. And it's said that they were all buried by a cataclysmic sandstorm. 50,000 people. So there you go. That is nature in Algeria between 1940 to 19. 50. That was freaking amazing. That was brutal nature, exotic nature, exciting nature, and I'm pretty sure nature that will kill me personally. Dead. No, that was really good, Ryan. That was fascinating stuff. Thanks, man. Thank you so much. My pleasure. I thank for all your tips. I'm confident that I will not be surviving anything desert-wise, uh, so I'm going to stay in your certainly crocs. in the Croydon area. <laughs> good plan. Some true advice. Sensible. <laughs> Thank you.
So I'm very excited to see what uh, my task for next week is. So why don't we fire up the Dursalator? Okay, the Dursalator is fired up and uh, all pistons are pumping, all spark plugs are sparking. It's good to go. Capacitor is go. Right, so what is my country, Ryan? Okay, all right, here we go. Your country, Pete, is Uruguay. Uruguay, okay, yeah. I um, don't know much about it, but I've heard of it, which is always a massive leap for us, isn't I it? know an awful lot about it, Pete, so uh, do you, you have now? to impress me a lot. Well, I'll find yeah. some obscure facts for you. I know it's in South America. All oh, right, so... that's good enough. <laughs> <laughs> that's it, that's all I know. <laughs> yeah. uh, right, when are we talking about then? 1776 to present, which is quite, uh, it, this almost sounds like I've picked this, but this is our free America period. So this is America independence from the point of uh, America, you know, becoming independent to the present day, 1776 to 2000, now. what year are we? <laughs> 21. <laughs> it did change recently in your defense. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and there you go. All right. That's exciting. That's a good range. I'm sure I can find something interesting there. Yeah. Uruguay, free America. And your topic is death. Death. Oh, wow. Well, uh, that is, that's pretty open. I'm excited about that. I'm hoping I could bring you next week some rocking death facts. <laughs> death in Uruguay from 1776 to present day. Right. I'm going to write that down. <laughs> Sounds a good idea. I'll probably come back tomorrow. Ryan, what was the thing? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I know you will. Okay. So that's our show for this week. Thank you very much for listening. If you'd like to get in touch about any of the things we've talked about in this episode, we can be found on our Twitter account. Uh, the show's account is at HHE Podcast, or you can email us at HHE Podcast at gmail.com. You never know, you might end up featured on one of our future shows. Amazing. And uh, one way to definitely feature on a future episode is to rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts. It really helps us out. Uh, and in the meantime, you can find and join discussions about the show on Facebook and on Reddit. So make sure to subscribe to those as well as to Twitter, Instagram or LinkedIn, where we post a hit of History Happened Everywhere every day and a new one will appear magically in your feed. And we'll be back again next week, obviously, with another episode. But in the meantime, do look out for The Verdict. That is our after show podcast where raconteur, wit and mind of many facts and gigantic brain, Paul Dursley joins us to judge, grade and cast aspersions on our episode. <laughs> you will. And if that's not enough, we now have a growing archive of old shows. This was episode 22. We've got plenty more previous to that. Um, and you can find those and download them, stream them, listen to them whenever you want uh, on YouTube or your own podcast provider or through hhepodcast.com. Thanks again. It's been great hanging out with you. You've been listening to... History Happened Everywhere. everywhere.